faculty and members of the student body of this great institution of learning, ladies and gentlemen. Now there are several things that uh, one could talk about before such a large, uh, concerned, and enlightened audience. There are so many problems facing our nation and our world that one could just take off anywhere. But today I would like to talk mainly about the race problem since I'll have to rush right out and go to New York to talk about Vietnam tomorrow and I've been talking about it a great deal uh, this week and weeks before that. But I'd like to use as a subject from which to speak uh, this afternoon the other America. And I use this subject because there are literally two Americas. One America is beautiful for situation. And in a sense, this America is overflowing with the milk of prosperity and the honey of opportunity. This America is the habitat of millions of people who have food and material necessities for their bodies, and culture and education for their minds, and freedom and human dignity for their spirits. In this America, millions of people experience every day the opportunity of having life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in all of their dimensions. And in this America, millions of young people grow up in the sunlight of opportunity. But tragically and unfortunately, there is another America and this other America has a daily ugliness about it that constantly transforms the buoyancy of hope into the fatigue of despair. In this America, millions of work-starved men walk the streets daily in search for jobs that do not exist. In this America, millions of people find themselves living in rat-infested, vermin-filled slums. In this America, people are poor by the millions, and they find themselves perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. In a sense, the greatest tragedy of this other America is what it does to little children. Little children in this other America are forced to grow up with clouds of inferiority forming every day in their little mental skies. And as we look at this other America, we see it as an arena of blasted hopes and shattered dreams. Many people of various backgrounds live in this other America. Uh, America. Some are Mexican-Americans, some are Puerto Ricans, some are Indians, uh, some uh, happen to be from other groups. Millions of them are Appalachian whites. 
probably the largest group in this other America in proportion to its size in the population is the American Negro. The American Negro finds himself living in a triple ghetto, a ghetto of race, a ghetto of poverty, a ghetto is to deal with this problem, to deal with this problem of the two Americas. We are seeking to make America one nation, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Let us stand, let us, chapter of Judges and the first and second verses, and then we'll drop down to the sixth verse and read the sixth through the 15th verse. Let us listen for a word from the Lord. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. Go down to verse 6 with me. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt. And brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians. And out of the hand of all who oppressed you. And drove them out before you. And gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the God's liturgy of the Amorites. In whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and said under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Jaaz, to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you. You mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all of his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this your might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. As you take your seat today, I want you to say faith to succeed. Come on and say faith to succeed. I want our children to know who they can be and what they can do. I want our children not to accept anything less than God's best for them and their life. I want them to never be bound by racism. I want our children to never be held back by hatred. I want them to never ever be limited by standardized testing and the false narrative of IQ. I want our children to be free. I want our children to be strong. 
I want them to be owners of homes, owners of businesses and technology. I want our children to be ambitious and they can do it. They can do it. Our children can do it if, if we help them. If we help them rise above the ravishes of racism, the hopelessness of hate, and the false narrative of white supremacy, I want our children to know that God put himself within us. Oh, bless his name. God put himself within our children. I want them to know and understand that the divinity of God is within them. God helps them through his divinity. God helps by putting in them God's only very own self so that they would never be afraid, faithless, and forgetful. And it is our responsibility to teach our children, to teach our children the faith that conquers anything, the belief that we can believe in the unbelievable and the spiritual strength to see the invisible, to teach our children and tell them over and over and over again, don't you ever let nothing stop you. Don't you ever let nobody stop you. When I started my doctoral dissertation years ago, it was during the same time in which our children were being murdered in the streets. It was the same time in which Trayvon Martin was murdered. The same time in which Sandra Bland and Orlando Castile and Michael Brown were murdered. No justice came. No justice came. And I made up my mind that I was going to spend the rest of my life and every fiber of my being training our children that they can fight back with faith and win. Listen, by teaching our children to think differently about racism, teach them to think differently about obstacles and, and the challenges and, and the setbacks that, that come into their life, that, that, that they, would, they would be able to deal with anything that racism brings, not just on the outside of them, but on the inside of them. And this is the condition, my brothers and sisters, that Gideon, that Israel, finds themselves in. In our text, Gideon is dealing with a system just like the system that we are dealing with. So Gideon is fearful. Gideon is faithless. And he has become forgetful. He is fearful. He is faithless. And he has become forgetful. The racist system that we are living in would have us to believe that we are weak, that we are incompetent that we are undesirable, that we are ignorant and that we are even oppressed. We must reject all of that. The system, listen, can only continue if we are fearful, faithless, and forgetful. It can only stop us if we are fearful, faithless, and forgetful because the system is based on fear and self-hatred. Look at what it says in verse 15. Judges chapter 7 verse 15 it says, So he said to him, listen what Gideon says, Oh my Lord, 
How can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan, my family is the weakest. Notice he says, I'm weak, I'm weak, I'm weak. I can't do anything about what's happening to me. You ever feel that way? If you're not careful, if we're not careful, we'll begin to think that we are weak and we cannot do anything about the conditions and the circumstances and the problem that we are dealing with. He said, my clan, my family is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least. Notice what he says, least. No, there's no least in God. God is no respecter of person. God sees everybody as the same because God put his divinity in every one of us who will claim the name of Jesus. There's no least in God. He says, my, I am the least in my father's house. This is, this is so, so devastating. It is, it is so dev It reminds me of Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. When it was time to go into the promised land and and get the promise that God had promised them. They had never even imagined of the promised land. They did not make it up for themselves. They, they did not think up the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey that God had that would give them overflow and blessings and meet all of their needs for generation after generation. They didn't think of this idea. God did. God told them that he would bless them and he would bless their children and their children's children and God brought them out of Egypt, brought them out of bondage, brought them through the Red Sea, performed miracle after miracle, but when they get to the promise, when they're there at the foot, at the gate, ready to go into the interest of what God has promised. Listen to what they say in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. This gives us a sobering account of what self-hatred looks like. This is what it says. We saw the Nephilim there. We seen, listen, like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. Nobody told them this. This is what they had told themselves. I want you to put that picture on the screen of that baby there. Can I take my time today? I need to share with you because I'm going to need your help this year. I need at least 70 folks who will help me help our children. Tell somebody, I said, it starts with our children. Starts with our children. Our children need our help, y'all. They can't fight like we can fight. They need our help. This, this, this picture right here breaks my heart. This picture is entitled The Effects of Racism on Our Children. The American Academy of Pediatrics has determined racism to be a national health emergency in our country. They said our children are going to school and learning how to hate themselves and how to hate others, not because of our children, but because of what adults are doing. That breaks my heart. Listen, having negative beliefs about yourself is self-hatred. And self-hatred leads to all kinds of problems. It leads to problems spiritually. Self-hatred leads to problems relationally. Self-hatred leads to problems educationally, financially, and health problems. Substance abuse and other self-destructive behaviors, it leads to violence and even suicide. Our children are committing suicide in record numbers trying to take their own lives. We have babies perpetrating violence against other babies. Young people killing other young people. The Bible says in numbers it's the grasshopper mentality. The grasshopper mentality. I am a grasshopper. I can't do anything right. You ever said that to yourself? I'm a grasshopper. I'm, I'm such a loser. I'm not smart. I'm not worthy. 
I'm ugly. Listen, the trauma of racism fuels self-hatred. When a child goes to school and is mistreated, when the law enforcement can mistreat our children, stop them because they feel like it. When children are placed in special education, put on medication, it results in self-hatred. We are the least likely parents to help our children. We listen to whatever the school tells us. Let them put them in special education and then we just leave them there. We don't even check up on them. I'm sorry, but I'm full today. They tell us our child needs medication. We let them put them on medication. Your child don't need no medication. Do you realize the school system gets federal dollars? For how many children they can put in special education and they choose your child? Let me, let me be a little nice. What, what I discovered, I discovered in my research that the number one challenge that we face is self-hatred as a result of internalized racism. Self-hatred as a result of internalized racism. In the early 1900s, Jewish scholars, now listen, not Jewish athletes, Jewish scholars, not Jewish entertainers, but Jewish scholars. Jewish scholars who were trained and had the ability to think critically about the issues facing self-hating Jews seeking to understand the people in their communities who exhibited visible signs of self-hatred. This is what Freud, anybody heard of Freud, Sigmund Freud, any psych psychology students in here? This is what Freud was writing about, and this is really who psychology was for. It was to do something to heal and empower the self-hating Jewish community. Sigmund Freud, the, the founder of psychoanalysis, wrote Moses and monotheism to explain Jewish self-hatred as a result of external oppression in Europe during the 1930s. He and other Jewish scholars studied the self-hating Jew and came up with the solutions that they are still using today. And we got to do something about what's happening with our children. Listen, nobody else is going to do it for us. Especially when they are benefiting from our self-hatred and our dysfunction. Judges, the sixth chapter, and the first through the six verses, it says that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They did what? In the sight of? In God. They did evil against God. Listen to what it says. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. They were living like animals. Does that sound familiar? We wonder many times, what's wrong with them? wrong with them for what's wrong with our children what's wrong with these people our men our women what's wrong with them the bible said they were living in caves and they were living in the hills and the mountains because they were being oppressed by Midian the problem is this is the reason that Gideon and Israel is in the condition they are in because they have turned their back on God Listen, we cannot be afraid. Touch your neighbor, touch somebody, say, we cannot be afraid. We cannot be afraid. We, we cannot lose faith. Touch them, say, we cannot lose faith. Tell them we must not become forgetful. 
See, because, listen, what happens to us is, is when we become afraid. What, what happens is when we lose faith and when we, when we become for, forgetful, we get caught up in the system. You say, well, I'm going to get mine. I'm going to get mine. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. Listen, the system doesn't work for you because it was never designed to work for you. And it will never work for you because the system is against you. But if you will turn to God for help, you got to turn to God. Tell somebody, say, you got to turn to God. You, you need God. You, you can't listen to what folks are saying about church. You cannot listen and pay attention to what folks are saying about Jesus Christ. You can't listen to these folk that's talking crazy about the Bible and the church. You got to turn to God. Problem is we got to turn to God. If we put God first and if we ask for God's help, because it's not in the system, it's in you. The victory is in you. It's not in people. It's in you. It's, it's not in what folk can do for you. It's in what God can and will do for you. It's what God put in you. Whenever you say Jesus is mine, when you say God is going to do it for me, when you begin to believe God and take God's word to be true, Look at Gideon. Look at Gideon. Gideon is threshing wheat by the wine press. He is fearful. He is faithful, faithless, and he is forgetful. Gideon is a farmer by profession and a soldier on occasion. His real name is Jerubabel. In fact, his very name literally means to war with Baal. His very name means that he is a warrior. It means that he will go to war against Baal, who is the god of the Midianites, who are oppressing them. Gideon is unable to farm openly, and so he's hiding by the wine press instead of being in the sheep, in the, in the place where you're supposed to take care of wheat. He's hiding. So he got himself a side hustle. We're in the gig economy. Many are working two jobs. Overtime. Come on, you can holler at me. Sometimes double time. Because we are dealing with oppression. Nobody should have to work like that. Doesn't matter how much unemployment there is. If the employment you have can't pay the bill. He is hiding, a farmer by day and a warrior by night. What do you do when fear grips you? What do you do when everything in your life seems to be falling to pieces? What do you do when all hell seems to be breaking loose? When fear, fear can grip your heart. Anybody know what I'm talking about when fear can can get a hold of you 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 can be a, a Christian but fear can get a hold of you 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 can be praying but fear can get a hold of you you can be doing everything right but fear can get a hold of you listen when I'm afraid I get in fellowship with God because the closer to God I get the more fear leaves me. First Timothy says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The enemy said that, that, that he can take us out in fear, but God said that if you believe in me, all things are possible. Glory to God. Point number one, Gideon's faithless. Gideon is faithless. Gideon receives a divine call from God. An angel comes and calls him by a name that he has never been called by before. Nobody has ever called him by 
the name that the angel calls him by. All he's been called by is loser. All he's been called is name. Y'all know some of the names that folk can call you, some of the names that people have called you and what they will call you, a lot of the other stuff they call you. Gideon had never heard his name called the way it was called. If you will listen for God, God will call you by another name. The angel calls him a mighty man of valor. Gideon, he responds with, with protest. He, he responds with, with inadequacy. He, he responds with feelings of self-doubt and self-hatred. At the same time, listening for the call of God's name. Well, what am I saying? I'm saying you got to listen to what God is saying. You got to hear what God is saying for you. God has a name that God names you by. God has a name that he calls you by. At the time of his call, Gideon didn't believe he is mighty. At the time of his call, he didn't believe he was a man of valor. He didn't believe he was a man of strength. Listen what he says. He starts insulting himself. He says, I am of the tribe of Manasseh. In other words, I'm from the poor people's tribe. I ain't nothing. I ain't nobody. I ain't never been nobody. Nobody in my family ever been nobody. In fact, the tribe of Manasseh was so poor until the poor people called them poor. And then he says this. He says, not only am I from the tribe of Manasseh, but, but he starts making excuses and he says, my family is poor and I am the least of my family. It doesn't matter where you start. What matters is where you finish. As long as you stop hiding and as long as you stand up and let God help you, but you got to let God help you. You got to let God make a way for you. Greatness is in you. And God, that's what God is saying. See, please understand this. The problem is not on the outside of you. Touch somebody and say, the problem is not on the outside of you. The problem is on the inside of you. See, 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 the power that God has given you is on the inside. God didn't give you power on the outside. God never meant for one group of people or one, one race or one gender to dominate another person. God never meant for some people to be rich and others to be poor. God said, I put the power on the inside of you. God put his power inside of you. Point number two, Gideon is forgetful. Not only is, is he fearful, but, but he's forgetful. He he's begins to, to forget. And, and where God brings us from, we must never forget where he brought us from. We must never forget how he's blessed us. We must never forget how he made a way for us. We must have remembrance instead of forgetfulness. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18 and 19, it says, And you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Why? So he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Then it shall be, if, 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 if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, little g, and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. Gideon forgets God. Israel forgets God. And so God has to help him remember. And that's what's happening for a lot of us is we're going through what we're going through because God is trying to help us remember. Touch somebody and say, you need to remember. You, you need to remember what God has done for you. You need to remember when you first got saved. You need to remember when God first found you. You got to remember where he brought you from. You got to remember that it's God that made a way. It's God...
remembrance. Remembrance. God takes him to the remembrance process. Touch somebody, say, it's just a process. It's just, it's just a process. God has Gideon go through three processes that's here in our text today. Number one, the first process is preparing for the battle. You got to prepare for the battle, y'all. Listen, you can't be no wimp. Bless his name. You can't be passive. You can't be passive aggressive. It's a battle. We got to fight the battle. Because the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. Preparing for the battle. God loves us. God loves us. God loves you so much until God believes in you. And God believes in you so that you can believe in him. And God loves you so much and believes in you so much. In fact, God loves you too much to allow you to stay the way you are. Process number two is the tearing down of false altars. Tearing down of false idols. We, we notice that, that the first thing that, that Gideon has to do, and he goes and does it, he tears down the altar of Baal. And he builds God an altar. Let me just ask you, how many of us have some other idols? How many of us have some false altars? How many of us have put other things before God? We put other people before God. We've put our own way and our own wisdom and what we desire before God. Some people put materialistic stuff before God. Some people put things and they put money before God and even people before God. Anything and anybody you put before God becomes a God, an idol, and an altar. So Gideon gets it right. He straightens it out. He tears down the false idol and he builds God an altar. You don't get what you want in life. You get what you are in life. If you want to get something different, you got to be different. If you want more out of life, you got to be more. If you want bigger, you got to be bigger. If you want better, you got to be better. You got to do better. You got to think better. You got to talk better than you're talking. The third process is the selection process. Touch your neighbor and say, be careful how you choose. Be careful. Chapter 7, verses 2 through 7, it talks about the selection process. It talks about how Gideon is going into battle. 32,000 people. Somebody say 32,000. 32, Started. <laughs> how many know there's folk that'll start with you, but they won't finish with you? Everybody that starts with you, it's not in the design for them to finish with you because in order to keep going, they're going to have to make a commitment. 32 started. God told Gideon to tell all of the people. Listen, this is all he said. Tell all the people who are afraid to go home. Look at somebody. Say, if you're scared, go home. He said, Gideon, tell them all of the folk who are afraid to go home. And that's all I found out that you got to tell some folk is if, if you are afraid you ain't got to ask them their name you ain't got to ask them nothing else all you got to ask them is are you scared then tell them if you're scared go home 22,000 somebody say 22,000 were left. Everybody else was afraid. And of the 22,000 of those who left and went home, only 10,000 are left. Most of the people are scared. 
Some of y'all got scared today when I started talking like this. I saw you, I saw you. Some left because they got scared. It's all right. It's human to be afraid. It's just not spiritual. <laughs> it, it, it's just not spiritual. It, 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 it's human, but, but it's, not, it's not spiritual. And, 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 and this is what God said. He said, all right, Gideon. And I imagine that Gideon was feeling pretty good right now. He said, all right, they, they left, but at least I got 10,000. He said, but I'm not finished, Gideon. He said, I want you to take this 10,000 and I want you to take them down to the water. He said, and all of them at the water, I, I want you to look at them. I want you to watch them. And every one of them that laps water like a dog, keep them. I, I, I hate to say this, but, but, but I'm going to have to say it. There got to be some dog in you. See, 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 when you're a spiritual dog, you, you, you understand something. See, I ain't talking about no human dog. I ain't talking about, this, this ain't flesh, y'all. This is, this is spirit. I'm, I'm talking about you willing to do whatever it takes for God. I'm, I'm talking about you willing to pray all night if you got to pray all night. I'm talking about willing to fast. I'm talking about if don't nobody like you, you still going to believe God. If don't nobody else stand with you, you still going to go for God. See, until you get a resolve in your heart and in your mind that I'm going with Jesus all the way, it makes no difference what the people say. Somebody said, who let the dogs out? He said, everybody who laughs like a dog, Gideon standing there, he looking at them real close. You, you know what it meant? You know what it meant? Dogs, they don't just put their head in the water. Y'all ever watch your dog? Some of y'all dog lovers, y'all dog lovers. Dog gets some food and looks up. Dog drinks some water, looks up. Dog want to see if you're going to mess with his stuff. <laughs> he he, he want to check you out. And, and you bet not mess with his food. I don't care who you are. That dog could be a little bitty dog. And sometimes the little of the dog the louder the bark. He said, if those folks, the ones that's going to go with you to fight this battle, if they don't lap water like a dog, you let them go. He let them go. Watch this. He started with what? 32,000. 22,000 left. Then he had 10,000. Took them to the water. God said, listen, all of them who lap water like a dog, they ready. Only 300 was left. You don't need everybody. You, you, you don't have to have everybody liking you. Not, not when you get started. It's amazing to me that what, what King, you, you got to watch that video. If you haven't watched this video, this video about the other America, you, ain't, you don't know King. A year later, he would be dead. Because everybody who loves the mountaintop speech, everybody who loves the uh, I have a dream speech, they love all that about King. But when it came time for the real people, America murdered him. They killed the prophet. That God sent. What did God say to Gideon and Israel? I'm going to send you a prophet because unless a prophet comes, 300 are left. Listen, listen, listen. What happens in you is more important than what happens to you. That, 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 that process here, this, this powerful process, it, number four is the victory process. It's the battle process. And it is not just the battle or just the victory. It is victory in the battle. Come on, say victory in the battle. God ain't never going to bless you outside of a battle. 
Somebody better hear me today. God ain't never going to bless you without some stuff that you have to go through, without some tests that you have to pass, without some trials. God blesses you in the battle. Write this down somewhere. I'm, I'm taking my time. I'm taking my time. We got to prepare for battle. We got to tear down false altars. We got to have the right selection process. But we also got to have victory in the battle. We're going to talk about this all, all year, victory in the battle, victory in the battle. Touch somebody and say, I got victory in the battle. I'm not waiting for it to get over with. I'm going to praise now. I'm, I'm not waiting for it to end. I'm going to shout now. I'm going to begin to thank God for the victory. I'm going to begin to praise God for his goodness right in the middle of this. In, in fact, right about now, if, if, if you mess with me, I'll begin to praise God up in here. Because God's been good to me. Oh, yes, he has. He, 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 he's been good to me. He, oh, bless the name of Jesus. God wants you to have victory in the battle. God wants to give you a trial and you still praise him. God wants to allow struggle to come in your life. You still pray. Because you know what Gideon had to do? He couldn't stay home. He couldn't hang out. He had to stop hiding. And where did he go? He went to the enemy's camp. He did like praise. He said, this is war. <laughs> this is war. He said, you can't have my family. This is war. Oh, bless the name. You can't have my peace. This is war. Gideon went to the enemy's camp. Touch your neighbor and say, when fear is gone. Faith comes. That's the issue with fear. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of faith. Having the same spirit of faith. Faith and fear cannot live in the same vessel. You got to give your fear to God by getting close to God, by going to the very place and deal. You got to deal with the issue. Everything that's in your way, you got to deal with it. He goes to the enemy's camp and, and then God blesses him in the middle of his battle. When fear is gone, your, your memory comes back. When fear is gone, your, your, your faith comes back. When, 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 when fear is gone, you, you begin to remember what God has done for you. Oh, bless his name. If God did it before, God will do it again. If God made a way financially 10 years ago, he'll make a way financially. I don't care how the economy looks. He'll bless you right now. Look at the weapons. Look at the weapons. I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish this. Look at the weapons. God gives them, he gives them two weapons. He gives them two weapons. Somebody say two weapons, two weapons. He gives them two weapons. He gives them the, the weapon of a trumpet. Strange weapon. Strange. strange. Give, them, give them a weapon of a, a trumpet. And then, then he gives them the weapon of a, 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 a jar with a torch in it, with a light in it. He gives, them, he gives them two weapons. He gives them a, a weapon of, of trumpet and, 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 and he gives them a weapon of a jar with, with a light in it, a torch in it. Let, let me tell you what the weapons mean. The trumpet stands for praise. Stands for praise. The, the trumpet, see, see one, one of the things that God is saying to you in your life is you've got to learn how to praise him. Because praise confuses the enemy. In the Bible, when, whenever you read about Israel going into battle, they sent Judah first. That was always the war cry. The war cry was always, send Judah first. And, and the way that Israel's enemy knew that, that it was God's people it is because they always heard praise. They always came in singing. They always came in praising God as, as they marched to battle. As they went to fight the enemy, they always came in with praise. And, and that was the first weapon. 
Tell somebody, I say, your praise is a weapon. Then the torches, the light in the jar. I love this one. Because what the jar is, is us. The jar is you. The torch, the light is Jesus. The, the light, Jesus, inside of you. Second Corinthians says that we are vessels. It says that we are human bodies that are jars of clay. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You are a vessel. Oh, bless the name. Bless his name. There's, there's a story of three wise men. And one wise man said to the other wise men, because they're standing there and they said, you know, where can we put success? Where can we hide success? And, 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 and they'll never find success. And so the first wise man said, I know what we can do. We, we, can, we can climb up to the highest mountain and we can put success on the top of the highest mountain. And the second wise man said, no, 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 I don't think that's it. I, I, I think that what we should do is we should take success and we should dive deep, deep down in, in, into the depths of, of the deepest ocean and we should hide success in the deepest ocean. And then the third wise man, after hearing what they said and pondering, thinking about what they said, they said, oh, he said, brothers, you got it all wrong. What we got to do is we got to take success and we got to put it somewhere that, that, that they will never think to find success. He said, because if we put success on the highest mountain, men will only climb. And they will climb to the highest mountain. And they will get success off the highest mountain. He said, and if, if we put success in the depths of the deepest deepest ocean that, that men will learn and they be willing to dive and they will dive and they will get success in the deepest ocean. But if we put success and hide it on the inside of them, they, they will not be willing to go inside and find success there because the most difficult place to ever go is to go inside. The most difficult and challenging place to ever let God be God in your life is inside. We like to keep God on the outside of us. Oh, but if we will take the weapon of our warfare and if we will begin to blow the trumpet, if we'll begin to shout praises unto God, if we'll begin to give God our best, if we'll give God everything that we have, God will He will make a way. He will if, if, if we will take the light The light is in us. How many believers are in here? You believe. You believe in Jesus. You, you claim the name of Jesus. You, you confess that he is the Lord of your life. The Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. And who is it that overcomes the world? They who believe in Jesus Christ. And that God has raised him from the dead. I'm a believer. And if you are a believer, his light is in you. God says, take those jars, those glass jars with the light in them and get your trumpets and go to the enemy's camp and blow your trumpet and break your jars. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Oh, my God. When they blew their trumpets, Jesus, when they broke their glasses, all of the enemy began to run. They began to be afraid. They began to turn on each other and begin to kill each other. And they wiped out the enemy. The Bible says there were so many of them until they were like locusts and grasshoppers. It said they had so many enemies. Somebody know what I'm talking about. Because you got some enemies. Some of us even got some frenemies. Some of us got some folk that's supposed to love us, but 
They don't know how to love us, but we don't have to worry about it. If we would just praise God, if we would just give thanks to God, if we would just say yes to God, if we would just... Glory, hallelujah. We got to let him have his way. God will make a way for us. Let's stand. God will make a way for you. He's a way maker. He's a way maker. If we would be faithful, if we would remember, if we would not be afraid, I pray today that God would give you strength. Lift those hands all over the sanctuary. I'm praying for strength.